we are living in a unique moment in history, not because anything that we are facing is brand new. I mean, all these issues of identity, uh, sexual behavior, homosexuality, even transgenderism, uh, non-binary identities, all, none of this is new. You know, Ecclesiastes says there's nothing new under the sun. All of these things, and, and even beyond that, the things that all of us in, in are dealing with in temptations or, or issues in our life, nothing that we face is new to humanity. Let me tell you what is new, though. We are the first generation that I can find anywhere in any culture's history that attaches sexual behavior or gender uh, identity, or let me back up, that attaches behavior to identity. So it used to be, I mean, people have always, there has always been people that have been homosexual or gay, or call it whatever you want to. There has always been people that have wrestled with gender dysphoria, which is the, the scientific term for those who struggle with their gender identity. None of that is new, but what is new is that we have attached that to people's innate value and their identity. So it used to be you could talk about behavior, like God, God's word prohibits certain behavior. But now when you begin to talk about prohibiting certain behavior, you're actually talking about prohibiting people's people and their value because now they've attached their identity to it. And that's, that's really the rub, that's really the struggle for us today because if you tell somebody, okay, you're gay and as a Christian, uh, I believe that God's word says that that's not the best, that's not his created order or design for human flourishing. So now I'm not just rejecting and disagreeing with your behavior, I'm actually rejecting you. Do you see where that has, and that's brand new. That has never existed before. That's a psycho science uh, impact upon our society that goes all the way back to Freud, goes back to the sexual revolution of the 60s, per, uh, permissiveness, and then the social sciences and psychology of our day that attaches that. Because on one hand, about 20 years ago, we were told, well, we're born this way. And that it's actually a biological reality and we can't change it. But now in the last 20 years that we've accepted that and said, well, then we just have to love people because they're born that way. Now transgenderism comes on the scene and says, no, I can choose to do whatever I want to with my body. Even though I was born a man, now I can choose to be a woman. And so now we're told, no, now you have to give people permission to just choose. So which one is it? Were you born wrong or were you born right? Do you choose wrong? Do you choose right? And it's actually contradictory. When you look at the LGBTQ plus, now it's two-spirit, I plus, add your alphabets uh, to, the, to the line there, it's actually self-contradictory within itself. Because on one hand, people are saying, I'm born this way. And the other hand is, I should have a right to choose to be whatever I want to be. And so as a follower of Jesus Christ, our, our, our allegiance is to the kingdom of God, it is to taking up our cross daily and following Jesus. It is submitting our lives to the word of God. And then when we're engaging with people, loved ones, friends, coworkers, people in our culture and society who have radically different viewpoints and worldviews than ours, our, our responsibility is not to condemn. Our responsibility is to live in such a way that we compel them to search out and to be open to the idea that every human being is born into sin and into brokenness, no matter what your sin or your predilection is or your identity is, and that our truest human identity is only found through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer. Jesus Christ is a equal opportunity Savior. Whether you are straight, whether you have struggled with homosexuality, same-sex attraction, whether you have gender dysphoria, whether you have a background. Jesus doesn't come to save straight, righteous people. Jesus comes to save broken, sinful human beings. And so if we're going to, 
If we're going to effectively represent Jesus, then we have to walk like Jesus. And so to the question is, how do we walk with friends and family who embrace a different identity than God originally intended for them? We have to recognize that before Jesus, all of us have embraced a different identity. We were in Adam, we were dead in sin, we were foreigners and strangers, and we were under the wrath of God. We deserved hell, and we were enemies against the kingdom of God, all of us. If you were, if you were always straight, that doesn't make you closer to Jesus than the person that's not. It just makes you dead in your sins, and the only true identity that is going to last forever is when, as I read earlier in Ephesians 1, you find yourself in Christ. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man or woman is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. Old things, old identities, old sin, old curses are put away, and behold, all things become new. So how do we walk? Well, we have to walk like Jesus. And here's what John said in John chapter 1, verse 16. For from his fullness, talking about Jesus, we have received grace upon grace. Is anybody thankful for the grace of God in your life? Okay, me too. Okay, and then it says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. So how did Jesus walk in relationship to people that were broken? He walked in grace and truth. Grace meaning that we love people. We don't love people because they're perfect. We, we love people because God loves people. We love them, we have grace for them, we have mercy for them, because outside of Jesus, we know that they're lost for eternity, and our desire should be for them to be able to find life, redemption, and restoration in their life from brokenness, all brokenness through Jesus. But we also walk in truth. And truth is that we recognize that because we love them, we're not going to hide truth from them. Because we love them, we're willing to risk relationship in order to present the gospel to them. Because we love them so much and because we know that God loves them so much, we don't want them to continue to in, be in a destructive, less than flourishing lifestyle or identity. And so we have to walk in grace and truth and realize, as this person said, how do we walk in love with them through that journey. Well, we walk in love, but we also need to be honest with them and, and share truth, be truthful, represent the kingdom of God and biblical truth in our conversations. And sometimes that is going to mean that those relationships become, uh, they become broken or parsed. That means sometimes they're going to choose to say, well, if you don't, if you don't accept me the way that I am, then uh, we can't be friends. Uh, or I, I don't want to have anything to do with you. If that happens, let's make sure it's because they choose that and not because we have represented that. Let's make sure that we choose to love them in grace and truth through Jesus Christ, okay?